So in a video last year, I talked about the Deutschland Ring, the German mega circuit that was designed to replace the Nürburgring. And the whole thing was a vanity project built using slave labor from Mr. H's political opponents. And it was built on the Czechoslovakian border in a similar manner to those empty Korean hotels that they just keep putting bigger and bigger flags on to wave their willies about. And in that video, I mentioned that after the war, Dresden and the region near it became part of communist East Germany. And I also said something along the lines of, the Eastern Bloc didn't really do racing. And what I meant was, racing on the international stage. Aside from Lada in rally, obviously. And I'm pretty sure there has only ever been one driver born in the Soviet Union to participate in Formula One. And that man is Vitaly Petrov. Now, no doubt somebody's going to go, but you forgot, but unless there is a driver from Tajikistan that's completely passed me by, Petrov is the only one. But as for drivers born in the Eastern Bloc as a whole, there's Robert Kubica, Zolt Baumgartner, maybe even Nicky Lauda, depending on which part of Vienna he was born in. But anyway... While the USSR and the Eastern Bloc didn't necessarily take part in things like Formula 1, they had their own racing series that took place across the Eastern Bloc and the Warsaw Pact countries and all of that stuff, and they even had their own racing ladder. And as a disclaimer, I'm sorry if there aren't any images in this for you to look at. As I keep saying, I can only use public domain and Creative Commons stuff, so what these videos basically do is give you the overview and then you can go and do your own Google image searching afterwards or while you're watching along, whatever you want to do. I know it sucks, but I'm not getting done for copyright again. And I'll do my best to try and find stuff, but I get the feeling it's gonna you know, be mostly maps rather than pictures of cars and engines. I did find a couple of the cars through doing some research, but whether I can get away with fair use is another story. Plus, it's the Eastern Bloc, it's the Soviet Union. Chances are there aren't gonna be that many anyway. So following the Second World War, the world was a very divided place, and some countries were divided, most notably Germany. And during the war, a lot of the pre-war racing cars were stored away under lock and key, and it was a case of if, rather than when, they emerged after the war to race again. And countries that had been under some sort of German influence in the East now fell under the hammer and sickle of the USSR and communism. And if the new communist governments were going to get their hands on some sweet pre-war racing tech, they were going to have to have a good look for some barn finds. According to one source, Czechoslovakia was a good place for dumping these pre-war cars, and a Mercedes W124 was found in Prague following the end of the war, and the Mercedes racing project quickly became a Soviet racing project. Now as Mercedes factory located in French and later US West Germany, it wasn't going to be a simple case of hopping into Prague and going, do you mind awfully if we have our cars back? And with Mercedes being Mercedes, they just built all new cars and were quite successful before, you know, swiftly retiring from motorsport in 1955. Auto Union was in a tricky situation given that Ferdinand Porsche, the head of Auto Union's racing program, was being tried as a war criminal and couldn't go back to Stuttgart. The factories were in East Germany and got dismantled and the company started again near Munich and evolved to become what we now know as Audi. What was left of Auto Union's technology and assets almost disappeared completely if it wasn't for a man called Vasily Zhugashvili, and I hope I've got that pronunciation correct. Now, he had quite a famous dad. You might know him more as... Joseph Stalin. Vasily wanted to revive the German slash N-word tech and use it to race with, and since his dad was one of history's biggest bastards, he could use his position to set up some racing series. Then, in the 1950s, the USSR set up its own motoring club, the CAMK. In 1956, the CAMK officials were invited to some Formula 1 events by the CIS, which later evolved to become the FIA. And they had a look around and thought, hmm, this is all good fun, we're enjoying this, we might be able to get on board. But instead of sending their best engineers and their best drivers to take part in this series and take on the likes of Ferrari and Maserati and people like that, they simply went back to Moscow and set up their own racing series instead, taking with them what they'd seen going around the Formula 1 tracks. Now finding information about the nitty gritty of all this is pretty hard. I did find some links to some websites through trawling the Autosport forums from way back, and some of the websites linked regarding open wheel racing in the former Soviet Union look to have Russian domain names which, for some reason, 
I'm not able to gain access to. Who'd have thought? But what I can find for you is that the Soviet Union had its own version of Formula One, and it was called Soviet Formula One. An inventive name, I know. And the series started in 1960, 10 years after Real F1 started and ran to pretty much the same rulebook. And it wasn't sanctioned by the FIA in any way, it was sanctioned by CAMK and the Soviet government. And while Formula One was about you know, designing the best car and racing it and being the best in the world and being the best you could be and taking on the world, Soviet Formula One was more about trying to do things better than the Americans and the Europeans and the Australians and trying to make the Soviet Union look great internally and externally. So just like the Deutschland Ring, it was all one big propaganda exercise and this series ran from 1960 all the way up until 1976. But it has to be said that in 1961, 1962 and 1968 there were no seasons owing to a lack of entries and also owing to a lack of circuits to, to use. Sometimes the seasons would be just three races, all at the same track, in the same day. And that would be your season. But I did find a list of winners using Web Archive and even up to page four of Google. The first winner being a man called V. Shakvert... Shakvert... Dov? Yeah, we'll go with that from what is now St. Petersburg, driving a GA22 Volga. I can't give you a picture of what it looked like, but I'll tell you what it looked like. It looked like a Formula 1 car. Well, it looked like a late 50s, early 60s Formula 1 car. Specifically, it looked like a late 50s, early 60s Formula 1 car if you were trying to draw a late 50s, early 60s Formula 1 car from memory. It was basically, Mum, can we have Formula 1? We have Formula 1 at home, Formula 1 at home, you tried to buy an F1 car off Wish, all of those memes, you know, it was a little less in terms of the engineering, but the overall concept was very much the same. So as you can imagine, it was Soviet and Eastern Bloc drivers driving Soviet and Eastern Bloc cars. Cars that could take up to four years to design and build because of the way everything worked over there. And with the exception of 1971, 1974 and 1975, all of the winners were Russian. The three exceptions were drivers from Tallinn, Estonia and Tbilisi in Georgia. And as far as I can tell, there were no repeat winners. But like I said, there were issues regarding entries and places to race. As few as 10 people would turn up to race and that would be that. And while I can't find much in the way of actual stuff for Soviet Formula 1, there was also the Cup of Peace and Friendship, which was basically Soviet Formula 3. But I did manage to find some Soviet era racing cars on race department that I'll link to in the description that you can run in a set of Corsa. They're not exactly what was used, but it's close enough. Sorry, it's the best I can do. And in this series, it was the East Germans and the Czechoslovakians that dominated, with Heinz Melkus being the man to beat in the early years, as well as a myriad of Czech drivers. And the Czechoslovakian drivers also dominated the touring car series that supported this Formula 3 series. The Soviets, meanwhile, weren't so good at it. But it was Formula Easter that really took over from Soviet Formula 1. And what this series was, was... It was Formula Ford with extra steps, if I'm being honest. They had 1.3 litre Lada engines that were good for about 75 horsepower, and they raced at tracks such as Schelitz or Schiltzitz or something like that in East Germany, Most in the Czech Republic, Minsk in Belarus, and Kiev in Ukraine. These cars were cobbled together from whatever was lying around, to be honest, so they couldn't have been particularly safe. The engine was out of a Lada, the gearboxes came out of a Zaz 968, and the suspension was out of an East German built Barkas minivan which is probably why the East Germans and the Czechs were so good, because they had an auto industry and a history of engineering in pre-war Europe. The Hungarians, the Romanians, the Armenians and so on, they didn't have a motor industry, so they had to just work with whatever they could get a hold of, and that was going to be very, very expensive. And in trying to keep up with what Formula One was doing, in the early 1980s, this series even went ground effect. The TARK or TARK cars built by the Estonia company based in 
Well, Estonia tried to export these cars for use in Western Europe, but because they were so crap aerodynamically and had very little power and were very, very heavy compared to what was being used in Western Europe, so we're talking like Formula Fords and things like that, they never really took off and they were just basically kept for racing on the other side of the Berlin Wall. And in a way, it's actually pretty cool that there isn't much in the way of pictures to show you because it's typical Eastern Bloc, it's typical Iron Curtain, it's all very secretive, it's all, it's all very Cold War, but it's actually amazing how any single seat racing ever happened at all given the way that the political ideology in Eastern Europe in the Cold War worked. Getting the funding for motorsport in that political ideology was going to be very difficult. Things like football, swimming, athletics, that's something that any person can do. Motor racing, on the other hand, isn't an everyman sport, and the elitism of top-level racing wasn't in line with that idea that everybody has a champion inside them, to quote a Reddit post that I found. Which is probably why Eastern Europe was geared more towards motorcycle racing than it ever was towards cars, because motorcycles were cheaper, they were easier to get hold of, and you could run them as a one-man operation, and it was more of an everyman sport. And that factory that Joseph Stalin's son got his hands on started pumping out high quality motorcycles in the late 1950s. And it was Ernst Degner, the Degner Corner in Suzuka, that's the same guy, that became the East German motor racing hero as opposed to Mikhail Sapoznik, which is probably the cleverest joke I've ever written. And only one country on the other side of the Berlin Wall would host real F1 during the Cold War, and that was when Formula 1 started visiting Hungary in 1986. But they only went to Hungary because it was an alternative to where they were going to go in the first place. The first choice was Yugoslavia, because Bernie's wife at the time was Yugoslavian. But Bernie and his advisors went to Yugoslavia and to the Soviet Union and went, Are you mental? and then went to Hungary instead, and Bernie fell in love with Budapest the instant he saw it. The Cold War ended in the early 1990s, and with it the Soviet Union collapsed, and those Formula Easter cars just basically morphed into Formula Ford. So then, a look at racing series on the other side of the Iron Curtain and stuff like that. Sorry if it's been a bit bland in terms of pictures and stuff, but I can only do what I can do in terms of the rules, so... Yeah, if there aren't any pictures out there with somebody to credit, I'm not putting them in because I just can't risk it, so I do apologise again. But more importantly, are you old enough to have seen some of this stuff? Do you live in the former East Germany? Do you live in Poland? Do you live in the Czech Republic or anything like that? If you did see any of it, let me know down in the comments, and if it's interesting enough, I'll pin it for the whole world to see. And while you are scrolling down to comment, if you did enjoy the video, then give it one of these. If you're not already, subscribe and get that bell on so you never miss out on a future video. Massive thanks as ever to the good folk of Patreon for the continued support, and this list does need to be updated for March, because I've seen there are some new members to the Patreon Massive, and that's when I update the list. I update the list at the end of every month. It's just easier for me to keep track that way. But if you do want to join in, you can follow the link in the description, where there will also be links to Discord, and also to my socials. So until next time, I've been Aidan Millward. Have a great day wherever you live in the world, and I'll see you all again soon for another video. Goodbye.